Welcome to Across the Optiverse. My name is Audrey van Uke. And I'm Dean Kennedy. We didn't find a podcast with enough tech and innovation, so we, we created, created our own. own. These podcasts are going to be a series of episodes where we get to talk code and develop some tech insights with our colleagues and hopefully some really awesome guests. Oh. Let me jump in. Today is, in fact, our first kickoff episode mm -hmm. with our colleague, Kirsten Smith, who has been dipping her toes into one of the coolest projects ever, AI in medical imaging. So before we get our geek on, because yeah. I said the words AI and medical imaging, <laughs> there's a lot of questions, let me introduce our guest. If you would like to skip to certain parts in the podcast, you can jump to 1 minute 35 seconds to find out who Kirsten Smith is. You can jump to 11 minutes 54 seconds to find out how AI is empowering jobs, not replacing them. And then finally, to find out about the key takeaways from using AI and medical image analysis, you can jump to 24 minutes, 55 seconds. Enjoy. Hi, Kirst. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, really excited. It's our first podcast with yeah. a guest. Yeah. So before we dive into the topic, which is transforming healthcare with AI and medical imaging, I want to ask you a bit about yourself so that we get a good idea of who is Kirsten. Um, so I know that you did a biomedical engineering degree at WITS and you qualified in that, but you also did a master's, um, which had a really interesting topic. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that, your background? Sure. So I did, I did electrical engineering after the biomedical and my master's was in you know, you know the nerve, the baroreceptor in your major artery, it picks up pressure changes when you stand up or sit down and you feel a bit lightheaded. And so my master's was actually modeling mathematical models of that nerve as if it was a sensor and then working out and simulating it in Simulink to see what's the frequency response and essentially what are the dynamic characteristics of that nerve as a sensor. And that was what my master's was about. Um, so I'm quite passionate about all things tech, innovation. I have quite a mm. flair and interest in the medical clinical side of things, but um, quite a broad exposure to a lot of different things over the years. Um, this year is my 10th year at Optinum. Yay. And I've had a lot of access and opportunity to work with different industries in mining, finance, manufacturing and recently medical that's fantastic so the journey at Optinum you started about 10 years ago now wow it's been a long time also for me and Dean <laughs> <laughs> um, how did that come about um, I think when we first got to know each other we had that conversation you have this intense passion and love for the math mathematics side mm. and the tech side um, so how did you find yourself at Optinum and tell us a bit about the journey that you went through at Optimum. Interesting know. question. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I left Varsity. And I joined a multidisciplinary engineering company. And I was working in the rail sector. And I walked the track. And I had drawings of substations and various things. But I really missed the maths a lot. Mm. And I think in retrospect, I really fell in love with Optimum's vision, which is... Um, you know, growing and building South Africa's knowledge economy. Mm. And so I feel like that's one been one of the, you know, aligning purposes to what the work that I want to do. Um, and yeah, so through my journey at Optinum, I started doing consulting and software development in mining projects, finance projects. Um, there was a manufacturing transformer modeling project um, and then moved into a different side of the business to do the leading and managing of the application engineering team at the time. And so I got exposed to marketing, technical support, technical service, um, you know, prototyping, exploring and discovering challenges with clients and from a wide range of clients. Um, and, and then also some of the training and knowledge transfer from those areas mm. um, 
you know, we also picked up and ran the backward program, which Optimum ran for many years. And then we transformed that into a graduate program. So I started the graduate program at Optimum and it's been running successfully now for four years. And we have a lot of good people here because of that. And yeah, so where I am today is I'm the head of strategic innovation at Optimum. And really what I do is I, I've been working to working with clients who've identified a market opportunity in the space that they work in. And we found a product if we can find a product or something to build that will help them, can we work with them and do some knowledge transfer and actually build a product mm. or deliver um, some kind of capability into the market? Um, so it's it's an interesting role and it's changing and evolving all the time as Optimum is itself. Um, and yeah, kind of trying to do a new thing, but doing also what Optimum does, which is building and growing South yeah. Africa's knowledge economy. Yeah, yeah. So I want to actually touch on that. Um, really broad range experience. <laughs> like you said in the beginning, you've, you've worn a lot of different hats and yeah. you've, um, I think, crafted a very unique skill within our business in Optimum, um, but also for clients as well. Mm. There's such broad range experience um, touching on lots of different aspects. I think makes for very interesting conversations with clients. Um, but to touch on that knowledge economy, the way Optimum says it, um, completely agree with that. So some grads we still have here, which is great, but a lot of those other grads are now out in the economy, yeah. um, skilled and also experienced and with the broad range of clients at least yeah. and projects. So really happy about that. But I think more importantly, the knowledge economy that we're trying to get into now mm. or uh, affect positively is the healthcare industry, mm. at least within South Africa. Mm. So that's the project that you've been busy working on. Can you give us a broad strokes picture of what is this project um, and how did you get started with it? So uh, a few years ago now, I met up with... Um, who was the, he was the chief operating officer of a medical device manufacturing company. And he was challenged with trying to bring new innovations into the product that they've been manufacturing for years. And so essentially what their medical device is, it's a radiography, radiological device. It does, um, it creates images which help clinicians to diagnose and detect injuries in a trauma situation um, or in a forensic situation once the person's passed away to work out what, what's happened to them. And so how that came to be, you know, when I met that person and I started working with the company, they, they really were struggling to, they, they wanted to learn and they wanted to build mm. new things. They needed a little bit of support in the capability of data science and software engineering, which is a place where we we do quite a bit of work. And I think where they they had experience was in manufacturing and, you know, um, from a physical device point of view, the certification, the regulations, and how to engage with the clinical market. Um, so it was a very, like, novel opportunity for us to do work in that space. And based on my background in biomedical engineering I was super keen to try and make that a reality um, so yeah yeah that's where it came from so what was that gap that gap that that COO was looking for that we helped so, did we help identify that so he was looking to do um, an AI feature for a radiology application and he had approached a lot of universities about the capability he wanted to bring in. Mm. And, you know, a lot of researchers were kind of bored with the problem. It exists. There's a lot of tools and capability that exist in the market already. And so it's definitely not um, new technology from a research point of view. Mm. And it still left him in a position where he was stuck about how to take what exists in research and move it into the real world, which is something I'm very passionate about myself. So 
that gap was what we stepped into the beginning there was we actually took two VACWORK students over a six week period. We had something like a hundred images and we, we built an unpaid proof of concept to show that the technology exists, we can use um, existing tools and we can pull in the images data in the data format that he has. We can apply models to it and we can visualize the results in an app, which allows for the flexibility of seeing different images and the responses from the, the AI model. And so what that gap was, it gave him something practical, essentially a technology demonstrator that mm. he was able to then motivate to um, funding bodies or to the board that this technology is within reach and it is, we are capable of it in South Africa and we can take a South, Africa, South African manufacturer of a medical device and we can extend the existing software development to incorporate AI into their offering. So for us, the way that I hear it is the gap wasn't so much the technology itself, the fact that there was AI involved. The gap was actually knowing that the technology existed, but putting it into reality, putting it into the market itself. Yeah, and, and working through the, the real um, constraints that the data is not a curated, <laughs> you know, perfect data set that, that you often see in research where you, know, you can choose your data set to test your hypothesis or to um, solve your research question. We, in this, in this sense, we have to take what exists yep. and apply it to real world data and make a plan with what can we do. Let's chat about that a bit. So the skill set required. So we have things, we have people who are radiologists who are doing this. So the medical device that you're talking about with this new added technology of AI doing this image detection or object detection within it within images, if I understand correctly. Um, how how is that fitting in with the skill set that we already have in the country? Um, and is it empowering what we're doing within the medical field? Hmm. So it's a brilliant question. I mean, often often there's a lot of uncertainty about AI replacing um, jobs or replacing people and absolutely we have radiologists who are specialists that train for many many years um, to be able to recognize patterns in that kind of data mm. and to diagnose. I think one of the realities though is that those resources are extremely constrained and scarce and so if you think about uh, public hospitals in the country they have yeah. very little access to those kinds of specialist skills and so, and on the other hand, those specialist resources are not able to provide the same service to everyone. And so for me, I think about it as a capability extender. So this AI and radiology feature allows them to actually extend their reach to more people and to a greater public audience than they normally are able to do. And so I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done with clinical partners in understanding what is the role of AI in extending their abilities and their capability, but definitely not to replace it. I mean, for those of us who work with AI, an AI will never be able to replicate the creativity mm. and broad experience of a human being. Um, human beings are able to generalize between different scenarios and different data inputs. So they can see the patient, they can read the report, they have a history. Um, these are, and they have years of experience where the AI is, got, is generally, excuse the pun, is specifically targeting like one data source at the time or maybe two or maybe three, but for specific examples mm. to do a specific task. And in general, it's to reduce the menial load for somebody like a radiologist who, who would not have the time to do that. Yeah, so let's touch on that. So, I mean, we'll probably still need radiologists, um, so we'll maybe for the, the bigger, more complicated um, cases that come through, um, even just continuing the accuracy of how this medical device is performing. Mm -hmm. But then in my mind, so, um, I attended one of your presentations, and in that presentation, you showed 
um, sort of a diagnostic of how this machine would work. And it's a full body image scan, from what I understand. So it's a whole human being is stepping into the device, and that device is scanning x-rays. Um, but with this added technology, picking up faults, atypical or abnormalities, I guess is the right word, um, in how many seconds? So, yeah, we've had a moving target in terms of what is our minimum viable product, but we're at the moment we're targeting like five seconds. So for trauma, that's a huge, huge yeah. plus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so very few radiologists that we have in our public hospitals, exceptionally skilled but overworked, yeah. being pulled left, right, and center, not just in the trauma um, sections of the hospital, but everywhere else in the hospital. And so a device like this can ease that burden, yeah. but also address immediate traumatic needs at the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So our, our first rollout is actually to take like a full, that full body and break it up into sections to make it easier to digest for the radiographer. And it's a small component that we are then able to extend to say, okay, can we classify each of those segments or regions as to whether they're normal or abnormal. And, and so there's a lot of value for, in, there's, a, there's a chain of radiographer, trauma doctor, radiologists as a planning tool when you have a patient who comes in who literally has a javelin pole <laughs> going through them and one dedicated well-positioned scan is not going to work out. Yeah. You just kind of want to get that person on the table, 13 second scan, and then be able to figure out what is the path of this pull through this person so that you can save their life. Yeah. And there's literally a golden hour on a serious like multi-trauma case to be able to intervene and, ch and save that person's life. Can you tell us more about that technology? Like, can we dive a little bit deeper into the tech behind how how is how have we built this AI to do this? Yeah, so I can talk you through the process of how did we, what was some of the technical processes. So, I mean, the data collation, collection, anonymization was really complex and we had to build processes in place to essentially anonymize all the data, then store it by obfuscating all of where did the data come from, what time was it collected, so that it's truly anonymized. And then to as we pull it in on the software side to partition it correctly so that we have you know, a training portion of the data, a testing portion of the data to say for the training to use, and then a validation part of the data. And so the data is like a large, huge part of how do we actually get a model working? Mm -hmm. And then we iteratively train models for the outcomes that we want. And we are constantly referring back to the data because essentially any AI model is only as good as the data we've got. So it's looking at how distinct are the normal from the abnormal? What are the different nuances in terms of what does the background look like? Are there any artifacts on the patient? What is the positioning? in the scan and those complexities really contribute to a large deal a large amount on on them on the model so one thing that's really interesting about the data set is turns out that females are third less likely to be in a trauma situation than males oh wow and so when you feed the data into the ai model if it sees a woman it's like biased to think that it's trauma it, because wow. it just does hasn't seen enough female subjects and so we have to balance the data set so that we manually are, you know, changing the data to have a different distribution so that our model is not biased by gender, which is fascinating. Yeah. So are we getting these data sets from hospitals or from research groups? We are getting this data from um, the pre-existing retrospective okay. data collected from the manufacturer mm. of the device from the hospitals, um, but retrospectively. Okay, okay. It's complicated. <laughs> There's so much going on. Can you chat a bit about that software engineering aspect? So like, I'm hearing model, but for me, I'm, so I'm hearing AI model, but 
I know a little bit there's also other models in terms of physical model of the machine, if mm -hmm. I have that right, and how those two plug in together. Um, can you take us through that? Sure. Um, so what we're working towards is, you know, you can have an AI model which works on the images and sends a result back to the user. So what we've been doing in this project is working with the existing user interface that our manufacturer developed their mm. software in, which is actually in C++. Okay. And so there's a significant amount of, once we've iterated on a model that's working well, we then need to deploy it and do a significant amount of deployment work mm. to actually ensure that that model is tested, it's verified, and it's you know deployed in a architecture that is functional, robust, extensible, um, and not bringing any additional errors or artifacts into the data. So for example, you have to look at the whole pipeline and if you're changing the um, size of the image or the perspective of the image, you can actually increase the noise in the image. And you know there are different steps in the process and so you have to look at the whole process then, and then build the architecture to be able to deploy that workflow consistently for every image, for unseen <laughs> images, and then have tests that prove that it's doing what it's supposed to do despite all the multiple developers and different mm. languages that we're doing. So we're working between MATLAB and C++, and we have to use extensive version control in GitLab to be able to manage all the versions and keep a consistent base. And then we also we push that across into the development environment by using um, compiler tools that actually are able to package the model workflow um, into a um, packaged file, which we can, which we then mutually wrote a DLL, a C plus plus DLL, which acts as a bridge between. So we compiled from MATLAB. We compiled to... from MATLAB and then wrote a DLL in C++ to actually absorb that packaged entity. And, and then that DLL, the C++ one, can be called from the existing user interface in C++. And so it's a, it's a very cohesive co partnership with our client and our partner um, to actually make sure that that happens seamlessly. So I was, yeah, I was just about to touch on that. There's so many different skill sets that I'm hearing about here like never mind the AI, <laughs> so just having that skill set in data science and artificial intelligence, but the, there's a skill set here with um, software engineering, architecture, um, there's a skill set with um, the verification, validation, deployment aspect, and there's also a skill set where apart from innovating within what you guys are building, I, I'm hearing a lot of innovation in terms of that collaboration yeah. and that partnership as well. Yeah. How, how's that journey been? What, what was the, ex I mean, I think you're still working on it. So what has the experience been like? It's been a long journey. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, so initially it was an unpaid POC for six weeks. Then we did a paid POC for three months. And then we kicked off a minimum viable product a year and a half ago. Mm. And I mean, all in, we're looking at probably four years of active thought of, of and journey. engagement with this client. So it's been a long journey and it's been interesting to see how both organi an organization is not a static entity. So they are both moving and transforming mm. in time and people also move and change in time. And so it's really fascinating. And I think all this talk about like volatile, uncertain, chaotic, I always forget what the A is, but like this is our environment. This is the world that we're living in. And it's really for me the strength of the relationships between in the team actually is the greatest predictor of like the quality of our output the quality of the delivery and the quality of our success um, and so navigating that together as a team is gives us the best chance of dealing with all the changes that come up along the way is that a typical innovation journey experience do you think definitely definitely okay okay, okay i think we have more time, some more time left, just a couple of minutes. Um, yay. <laughs> uh, if I had to ask you one last question, 
what would you like me to ask you? <laughs> uh, I'd like you to ask me, what did I learn the most? What's one of some of the biggest learnings from this whole experience? Um, Your takeaways and yeah, what stuck with you the most? Yeah, I think the biggest thing has been, um, you know, as engineers and scientists, we're very quick to jump into the tech. And mm -hmm. it's a well-known there are books and articles about it. We know that the lean startup methodology <laughs> is to start with your market, to start with your end user. And as much as you can be told that, in principle, I have lived that experience in practice. And it is absolutely the most important starting point for any innovation, any technique. Is, it's not actually about tech. It's about the people. And it's about what, the, what is the base need and what is it that we can solve with a minimum amount of features mm. and effort to actually address that need? Um, so yeah. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Audrey. I could talk about this for days. I feel like we need a part two <laughs> <laughs> because I want to dive into the real like, technical essence of it. Um, and then I feel like we also need a part three to just talk about the innovation journey in general. Um, I know that this isn't the only thing that Optin would like to experience. We've got so many ideas and there's so much innovation we do in client projects regardless. Yeah. 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 Um, but I was so happy to kick it off with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening in, guys. You can find us on anywhere where you listen to your podcasts, be it Spotify or YouTube. We'll also be sharing a link on all our socials, so Instagram, LinkedIn, again, YouTube. You'll probably see us pop up. Please feel free to contact us if you have any queries and especially if you have any feedback. You can contact me directly on adri at optinum.co.za. Of course, that will be in the link to the show. Producers on this podcast were myself and Dean Kennedy. Editors were Dean Kennedy and Michelle Navarro. Until next time. Oh,